So let me say ni hao ma to everyone watching. There are more than 100 people watching uh, as attendees. Uh, keep in mind that you will have the chance to uh, ask questions later on. So check out the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, everyone. Ni hao ma. Today, we are pleased to present uh, Shirley Daniel, Director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute, or PAMI. Every year, PAMI holds an annual lecture, organizing it so well for so many years. And ThinkTech is, as before, delighted to be part of it, especially given the importance of the subject this year about China, which should be on our list of priorities for the United States for every one of us at all points and times. And it is our pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Paul Chung Memorial Webinar Lecture, celebrating the life and work of Dr. Paul Chung, the founder of PAMI. Shirley? Thank you and aloha Jay and everyone else. The Pacific Asian Management Institute was founded over 40 years ago in 1977 by Dr. Paul Chung, who was an economics professor at the University of Hawaii Manoa Scheidler College of Business. Dr. Chung foresaw many changes in the global economic conditions, and he realized how important the Asia Pacific region was going to be to Hawaii and to the rest of the US. Unfortunately, he was only in his 50s when he passed away over 30 years ago on August 28, 1985. Dr. Chung was born in Korea and came to the US for his education. He earned his PhD from the Michigan State University. After become a, becoming a professor at the University of Hawaii, he developed the early PAMI summer programs around the concept of planned interaction between students, managers, and international business faculty from around the world who were interested in international business and particularly the Asia Pacific region. Over the years, Dr. Chung invited a who's who of international business scholars from both sides of the Pacific to participate in the PAMI program. This Dr. Paul Chung Memorial Lecture is a highlight of our summer programs and is made possible by the generosity of Mrs. K. Chung, who established the Dr. N. H. Paul Chung Memorial Lecture Fund. Over the past 30 years, in addition to this lecture, Mrs. Chung has endowed scholarships and programs at the William S. Richardson School of Law, the Center for Korean Studies, and the Scheidler College of Business. We thank Mrs. Chung for her continued support of PAMI and for the University of Hawaii. I'd also like to thank you, Jay Fidel, and thank Tech for helping us keep this tradition of our annual lecture alive through the Think Tech platform. Thank you, Jay, for your continued support of the University and of PAMI. This year, since our topic focuses on China, University of Hawaii Center for Chinese Studies is also co-sponsoring the event and we welcome their participation. There are many other people with professional organizations, businesses, faculty scholars and alumni who have faithfully supported PAMI and the university through their time and scholarship support over the years. Thank you all for continuing to support our programs. We greatly appreciate your participation in the webinar today as we celebrate the life and the work of Dr. Paul Chung. Thank At this you, time, Shirley. I'll turn it back to you, Jay. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, let me introduce the guests. Um, Stephen J. Hartnett uh, is a, um, a professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Colorado, Denver. He served as the 2017 president of the National Communication Association and is a founding member of the Global Forum for Civic Affairs. He is co-founder, co-host, and co-organizer of the Biennial Conference on Communication, Media, and Governance, which is held in Beijing with the Communication University of China. And in 2022, he's playing these roles for the Shanghai Dialogue, Conversations on Communication, Globalization, and Urbanization, co-sponsored by the Shanghai International Studies University. Now more, Professor Hartner just published a new book, A World of Turmoil, The United States, China, and Taiwan in the Long Cold War. Very interesting. The United States, uh, the People's Republic of China, and Taiwan have danced on the knife's edge of war for more than 70 years. 
a work of sweeping historical vision. This book offers case studies of five critical moments, the end of World War II and the start of the long Cold War, the almost nuclear war over the Kimoy Islands in 1954-1955, the detente deceptions and denials surrounding the 1972 Shanghai communique, Taiwan Strait crisis of 1995-1996, and the rise of post-colonial nationalism in contemporary Taiwan. And there's the book. Diagnosing the communication dispositions that structured these events reveals that leaders in all three nations have fallen back on crippling stereotypes and self-serving denials in their diplomacy. The first communication-based study of its kind, this book merges history, rhetorical criticism, and advocacy in a tour de force of international scholarship. In addition, Stephen Hartman also recently published the editorial, No, China Will Not Invade Taiwan, uh, in, and that's in China. We want to hear more about that today. Xiaoning Su is an assistant professor in communication, journalism, and public relations at Oakland University. She served as the 2018-2020 president of the Association for Chinese Communication Studies. Her previous work on journalism and East Asian geopolitics have been published in Media, Culture, and Society, the International Journal of Communication, the Asian Journal of Communication, and the Taiwan Journal of Democracy. She's the recipient of the 2020 Honors College Inspiration Award and the 2021 Teaching Excellence Award at Oakland University. Prior to her academic career, uh, Sue worked as a communications specialist at Ogilvy Public Relations, you've heard of them, and for several political campaigns in Taiwan. It will be very interesting to hear her point of view on these things today. Let's begin with questions about international relations. Uh, Professor, these are going to be directed to you first. Given the extraordinary troubles we are having in the U.S., including but not limited to COVID, um, social problems, economic, political issues, and in the world in general, including, again, COVID, climate change, economic problems, security and human rights issues in developing countries and elsewhere, authoritarian leadership, protest, border confirmation, the persistence of destructive cyber attacks, et al. Do you think China sees or might see these troubles as opportunities for continuing aggressive self-interested strategies or a l'autre côté, that is on the other side of things, for soft power and or smart power policies, and for that matter, altruistic world leadership? or both, or a combination, all at the same time. So we need to look at changes in the tone of Xi and of China. Remember the news events this week, challenges in the South China Sea, increasing controls on releasing intellectual property to the West, Xi's new common prosperity policies reported in the Washington Post. And with the termination of tutoring and various business and media trends in China, which he feels enhanced disparity, but which some say are quite profound for China, a social uh, and economic uh, revolution of sorts. With the operative word controls, more and more controls in China by Xi. Um, how well does that bode? Does it bode, bode well or not? So what are your thoughts, Stephen? Be really interested to hear you talk about this. Uh, thank you, Jay, for having us. It's an honor to be here with you and your team. And hello to my dear friend, Dr. Chowning Su. It's always great to work with you. And Jay, you've asked a, a terrific question. To try to answer one small part of that question, I'm going to invite you and our audience to join me in looking at a map. If we could pull up this map. Uh, this is a map the CIA made of China's neighborhood. And I just want to ask you to think about how you'd feel if you lived in this neighborhood. Look at its northern border, almost a thousand mile long border with Russia. Think how bad you feel about Vladimir Putin and the Russian dictatorship. And imagine if they were your neighbors to the north. Look to the northwest. You see that China is bordered by Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. These are not stable regimes. Look to the southwest. It's bordered by Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, with whom it had, had open conflict in the past six months. 
And then if you look on China's eastern coast, it's surrounded by American allies, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand, Australia. What this map shows us, Jay, is that China lives in an incredibly dangerous neighborhood and it does not feel safe. So the first thing I would say for, for you and our audience today is that we in America tend to perceive China's actions as aggressive. But from the Chinese perspective, all they're doing is trying to create a little bit of border security all around their nation state. And so the first thing I'd say today is that both US foreign policy experts and China foreign policy experts need to do a better job of seeing our relationship through the eyes of the other. We cannot impose our vision of what China should be on them. They cannot impose their vision on us. We need to have a more mature and sophisticated communication paradigm so that we can understand each other's security needs. Now, the second thing I'll say, Jay, you mentioned COVID. The Chinese government is thrilled with what has happened in America, first under Donald Trump's catastrophic presidency and under the COVID epidemic. The reason being that when democracy looks bad, the Chinese think communism looks better. So we're in an international war of perception. The thing that we need to worry about as Americans is fixing democracy at home home. Democracy is only a marketable concept internationally if we can show the world that it works here at home in America. We may have a way to go on that. Um, okay. <laughs> as, as a follow-up, uh, Stephen, um, you know, what, what should the U.S. response be? And I, and I would add the fact that nothing is as constant as change itself. Uh, Chinese policies, as we know from the newspaper, are changing all the time. China, Chinese strategies, presumably the same thing. And, and of course, in the U.S., everything is changing. So um, ideally uh, and objectively, what should the U.S. response be? What kind of foreign policy steps should we be taking? And what kind of, um, you know, uh, what, what kind of vectors should we be following? What are, the, um, what are the subjects we should be studying in order to develop and change our foreign policy with the changes in their foreign policy? Well, Jay, that's, a, that's a, again, that's a great question and a complicated question. I would say the obvious answer is the first thing we need to do is reassert American leadership with our allies. The Trump administration destroyed our credibility around the globe. The challenge now for President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken is we need to rebuild our relationship with our partners in the, in the Pacific. We may not be able to change China's foreign policy. But we can make sure that ours is more humble, more based on collaboration, more listening and less commanding. And so that means we need to be spending our time, energy and money in Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Japan, South Korea. So our foreign policy needs to, first of all, focus on our friends and allies. The second thing we should be doing is finding places of partnership with China. Remember, Jay, that they have no indigenous oil production. <laughs> Everything that happens in China happens on imported resources, which means they are incredibly vulnerable to piracy on the high seas. Why are our tax dollars paying for protection of all shipping lanes in the Indo-Pacific? We should be partnering on that. We can share that cost. So fighting piracy is a shared concern. Talking about uh, climate change is a shared concern. Talking about drug trade is a shared concern. So A, we need to re- align with our allies. B, we need to find places of common ground and start from there. You know, um, Joseph Nye, Joseph S. Nye Jr. of the Kennedy School uh, has come to Hawaii on a number of occasions uh, to speak at CS, CSIS uh, Pacific Forum Board of Governors meetings. And he has uh, on repeated occasions talked about uh, smart power and soft power as a, an American you know, strategic um, uh, strategic approach. And, um, you know, I'm wondering um, where that is these days. Uh, I think back to the Marshall Plan and how valuable that was. And I, I'm in terms of smart power and soft power. Uh, and I'm thinking of Afghanistan. And when we left, we really left. I don't think we have but a very, you know, very threadbare kind of relationship with them now. Uh, and I'm not sure where we have a plan to develop a better one. But at the same time, this week's news reports that China is providing food and fuel and all manner of support to Afghanistan, uh, trying to literally build bridges. 
Um, how does the U.S. respond to that sort of thing? Uh, where do we have to come out and, and actually engage again in smart power and soft power so as to compete with what China is doing in Afghanistan right now? Jay, the way to think about Afghanistan is to remember when Senator Mitch McConnell said that his chief goal was to make President Barack Obama a one-term president. Remember that comment? Everyone took that as an indication of a war of partisanship and to say that McConnell would rather see America be stuck where it is than to see the Democrats get a win. China's thinking about Afghanistan right now is exactly the same as that. We've completely ruined that country. We've spent 20 years there, billions of dollars, thousands of lives, and yet there's no democracy, there's no functioning economy. So China's happy to see us fail in Afghanistan. That's the first thing to know. They're happy to watch democracy flounder. The second thing to know, though, Jay, is that when China rolls into any place, now everybody talks about the Belt and Road Initiative. China shows up with billions of gallons of oil and they build ports for people and so on. And China thinks they're going to win hearts and minds by doing that. And I got to... <laughs> No, 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 no. It didn't work for the British. It didn't work for the Russians. It hasn't worked for us during the Cold War. And it's not going to work for China. So China's happy to see us fail in Afghanistan. And if you want to think about realpolitik, we should be happy to watch them fail in Afghanistan too. They're just wasting their time and effort. This question is definitely going to be on the final exam, Stephen. (laughs) I love your answer. The answer was no, 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 no. Okay, let's uh, let's see. Um, the next question is addressed to uh, Professor Su. How have China's aggressive actions in the South China Sea triggered fears in Taiwan, Japan, Australia, in the Philippines? I think and other Indo-Pacific uh, neighbors. Um, this is this is a problem. Uh, how how scared are they? And uh, is it is a legitimate fear? Right. Thank you so much for having me today, Jay. Uh, Before I answer your question, I just want to say that as an international scholar myself on Taiwan, I truly believe in the power of international collaboration, cross-cultural communication. So I'm just very happy to be here today to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Paul Chan. And just thank you again for having me today. Uh, I like your question about South China Sea. Uh, Before we think about you know, the response from the international community, I think we should think about why South China Sea is important. It is important because it is a major shipping route and rich in resources, you know, from fishing to, to gas to oil. So for years, there has been a disputed water with several countries wanting to claim a piece of their pie. And the problem right now is that China is looking to take the whole pie for itself. That's where the problem is. Uh, China saying that they have historical rights to South China Sea. So if you can look at the slide, there is a map. Yes, so you will see the red line here. The red line here represent the famous nine dash line that China uses to claim its sovereignty in South China Sea, which virtually basically includes the entire body of the water. You know, Beijing sees South China Sea as an essential um, area to complete their maritime Silk Road, which is to complement their Belt and Road Initiative. And for that reason, uh, China has increased its military activities, expanded its fleet, uh, improved its technology in this region. So, so this is why this is a disputed water right now. So how, how, how does the international society respond to this aggression of China? Well, they, they, they really, really try to you know, work together and based on the uh, international ruling on China's claim. So in 2016, the international court in The Hague basically rejected China's claim. And this, this ruling really empowers in the international society to adding pressure on China uh, to maintain the freedom of navigation in this region. Uh, For example, as you can see in my next slide, just last month, uh, you have the joint naval exercise between four countries, Japan, the US, Australia, India, AKA the Quad, to basically sell through the region as a way to maintain its openness. 
uh, two days ago, September 8, I believe, the U.S. 7th Fleet conducted another round of freedom of navigation operation in South China Sea just as a way to reflect its commitment to the lawful uses of international waters. So this is just to tell you that, yes, this is trouble water. Uh, China really tried to expand its presence, its dominance in this region, but international society is also pushing back quite hard. For me as a communication scholar, I think the most interesting thing is to see how China is turning this international conflict into a domestic opportunity to, to boost nationalism and to consolidate the power of the party. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but in 2016, when the international court first rejected China's claim, the visual of nine dash line actually went viral on Weibo. A lot of people, Chinese netizens, use that visual as a way to, to pledge loyalty to the state, to the party. So it becomes such an event to, to boost nationalism and to consolidate power. So again, I think South China Sea is going to be a trouble area for many years to come. Uh, when we pay so much attention for this to be a international conflict, we should also pay attention to how China is turning this into an opportunity to consolidate its power. Yeah, just to uh, follow up on that, it, it, does it go beyond uh you know, the area right outside of China. I mean, I, I heard uh, at one point, maybe this is uh, old news, but uh, China China actually took its, uh, what is it, nine dash line uh, further east uh, and considered, um, you know, its, uh, its domain uh, uh, way, way further east. In fact, to a point on the map, not too far from Hawaii. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, within the last uh, two or three months, there was talk about, uh, was it China or maybe Russia, but there were ships out here, not too far from Oahu. Uh, and nobody knew why, and uh, there wasn't a lot of press about it, but um, you know, they, they have Hawaii on their minds. You know? uh, so where does Hawaii fit in all of that? Where does the United States and one of the 50 states fit in? Where does Guam fit in all of that? Uh, is this likely to expand east? Uh, what's the dynamic on China's intentions here? Uh, I'm sorry, the question? The... What's, what's the dynamic? How is it changing? What are their aspirations, all things considered? Sure, I'll jump in on there and I'll say that what they're doing, Jay, is they're, they're probing what the Chinese, uh, the People's Liberation Army and the People's Liberation Navy learned, particularly during the presidency of Barack Obama, is that they can push and push and push and we won't push back. And so they're gonna keep pushing. If, and if that includes pushing over to Guam and Midway and over to Hawaii, they're gonna do that. So we're gonna to have to, again, this is where I love Chow Ning's slide when she showed the quad doing a freedom of navigation sail together as an alliance. That's what the US and its allies need to do is to put together that regional partnership practice those freedom of navigation sales, make it clear that any uh, nudgings into the far reaches of the Pacific will be met by our pushing back. So I'm afraid that this is a, a moment of realpolitik. We need to show our willingness to defend our allies. Uh, and if we don't, then China will take that territory. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So, Professor Su, so in uh, recent years, many international companies and figures have been forced by China to apologize to China for offending the Chinese people, while some were accused of violating the One China policy, and that includes Marriott, Versace, and John Cena, is it? Uh, others were boycotted because of their support for Hong Kong's pro-democracy protests. Uh, Daryl Morey, uh, NBA, <laughs> the NBA, or, or Xinjiang. Uh, like H&M, uh, uh, Nike, Nike uh, and Burberry. And I'm, I'm sure there are others in a world where global brands are expected to advocate for global morality and social justice. How do they conduct themselves in the Chinese market? How do they balance profit and principle? Should they talk to each other, uh, form a collective, uh, do uh, better bargaining as, as a collective? What do you think? 
So I, I teach public relations and branding myself uh, at Oakland University here in Michigan. Um, I, I think what we are seeing is that we are in a time that societies are experiencing social reckoning. So as a, as a brand, you, you really cannot stay outside of that conversation. Your consumer, your customers have higher and higher expectations that you as a brand, you are going to live up to your social responsibility. They expect you as a brand, as a company, you are going to use your platform to advocate for social justice and positive social change. I think a lot of times the question is no longer what you are selling, but more like what you are standing for, right? So this is what we are seeing here in the US and in the Western context very, very clearly. And this kind of like social justice, social activism driven marketing proved to be very effective, especially here in the US. A lot of brand use this as a way to advocate for social issues, but then in return to increase brand awareness. So this, this was super effective here in the US. But once you move out of the Western context and enters the Chinese market, this is where we see the problem. Let me just use the example of H&M that happened earlier this year uh, as a way to talk about this disconnection between the uh, social driven, social activism um, marketing strategy and how that is sometimes lost in translation. So what we see is that last year in a statement, H&M say that they were concerned about Uyghurs being forced to pick cotton in Xinjiang. And because of that concern, they decided not to source products from Xinjiang anymore. This was an effort for H&M to say, we, we stand with the issue of human rights. We, we want to support them. We want to do the, the right thing. We want to have a higher standard, standard of morality. So, so their strategy is actually appraised in the US. However, Chinese consumers see this differently. They see this as a maneuver, political maneuver almost, to, to demonize China through spreading rumors and lies. They have a very different interpretation of what is happening in Xinjiang. And in, in a lot of minds of Chinese consumers, China can make no mistake. Any form of criticism is viewed as disinformation or just another attempt to, to bully China. Right. So, so back to your question, how do international brands conduct themselves in the Chinese market? I honestly think there is no perfect answer to, to this question. And I think the answer will be very, very different from industry to industry, from a brand to another brand. Uh, but my advice will be the earlier, the sooner the brand realize that you cannot separate politics from economics. And sooner you realize you cannot sacrifice principles for profit, the better. I mean, I mean, China is a huge market. It's it's tempting. It's almost irresistible, right? We we understand that. And I think the Chinese government understand that very well. Uh, they use that as a leverage to extend its long arm to almost every corner of the world. But in the meantime, Chinese market is highly unpredictable. It's highly unpredictable. So all the brands, international brands, especially in such a connected economy, I think they have to ask themselves what kind of price you are willing to pay for the profit and when is the time to, to draw the red line. This is not a question that I can give a perfect answer, but I would say that this is a question for brands to consider uh, in the times to come. Is it, is it working? I mean, uh, when, when they say, when the Chinese government says, uh, we don't want you to make any any statements that um, you know criticize us or um, you know or or take the wrong position on Taiwan, for example. Um, and I, I suppose some some brands will accede to that. They'll say, "Okay, all right, we agree. It's okay. We'll you know we'll we'll go along. We don't want to lose the market." That's not particularly ethical or moral, but that's what they say. The question, though, is that if they say that and a given brand says no, we aren't going to abide by that. 
uh, we're 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 going to you know keep on doing what we're doing. We're going to keep on taking a position. You know that Taiwan is independent, for example. Um, what has the Chinese government done? Has it cut them out? Um, have have they actually taken steps to follow through on the threat? Uh, so typically, we see like a chain effect if they you know stand by the message itself. Uh, if they refuse to apologize, if they don't do any uh, public form of apology, uh, a lot of times we see them being removed from the market. They are invisible to some extent. And I think there is a, a very interesting collaboration between the state media and social media in China. The state media would first publish like an opinion piece, uh, accuse the wrongdoing of the specific brand, uh, you know, on the wrong side of the history, making the wrong decision, the state media would first publish a statement in that direction. And the social media and netizens will quickly pick up that message and amplify that voice on social media. So that really leaves very, very small space for, uh, for the brand to survive in the Chinese market. Um, so so that's, that's why you see, you know, sometimes people just uh, decide to, 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 to apologize. Uh, John Cena, for example, months ago, he was promoting his new movie in the Asian market. He first came to Taiwan and then he was very excited about this movie being released in Taiwan first. And then he went to China and then all of a sudden there is this accusation of him saying that Taiwan is an independent country and they want to boycott the movie. And John Cena decided to make a video apology speaking Mandarin. And again and again and again in that video, he emphasized his love to the Chinese people and China altogether, right? So that's his way of handling the situation. And I think uh, to some extent that apology was accepted by the Chinese market, but I think John Cena has to remember, you know, it's not just China watching his management of the situation. The rest of the world is watching as well. And how would they interpret such action? And how do they uh, question his integrity and credibility from now on? So, so this is, I think this is the question for international brand. We are, we, like now you just cannot, uh, you know, hide information. We live in such... Uh, open information flow kind of society. The, the transparency of information is, is, is there. Uh, whatever you are doing in China, people would know. And if your action and your message is inconsistent, I think consumers and customers are smarter than that. Good. And the media has to be smart too. Yeah. How, how, good, how good a job do you think the media outside of China uh, is it doing a good job to bring these things to public attention outside of China? So I think I can answer this question um, in different ways. One, I'm very happy to see uh, the media outside of China is now paying more attention to uh, China related issue. So, you know, we talk about agenda setting in communication uh, just to have the visibility of the issue sometimes is the way to get public attention. So I'm very, very happy to see that, you know, there are more and more media uh, try to uh, talk about China, situations there, uh, have their uh, interpretation of the situation, like close attention. That, that's good. That's visibility of the issue, right? But then we move on to how do they tell the story? How do they tell the story? Visibility is just one thing. The next step will be what's the framing? What's the rhetorical strategies? Uh, I think some of them did a really good job, but there are also other media try to sensationalize uh, the issue to some extent. I mean, Stephen say that in the beginning, uh, a lot of times international message is not just for international audience. It is also for domestic audience as well. So I think there is some media here in the US try to use this anti-China um, message as a way to, 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 to unify its audience, right? So that kind of reporting could be really problematic. And another thing, that really complicate this picture of news reporting is that China is asking foreign correspondent to leave China. They are asking like Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, all the reporters to leave China. 
Um, and that make China this big information black hole. Like, where do you even get the information? How do you even portray a country uh, accurately when you don't even have access to the country? So I think all together, all of this become factors when we see the news coverage of China. Yeah. Wow. God, things are changing again for the proposition that we need to follow it. <clears throat> okay, uh, turning to you, Professor Hartnett. Uh, Stephen, along the same lines, the U.S. and China continually clash over questions of human rights. We know that, uh, you know, uh, to wit, uh, Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. The U.S. charges China with various violations, and then China alleges the U.S. is meddling in its internal affairs. And the U.S. says, uh, rather, China says that the U.S. has its own human rights problems, and indeed we do. Uh, but how could this dialogue be improved in the future? Do, do the human rights problems in the U.S. disqualify us somehow uh, from making charges against China? Do the problems in the U.S. make China stronger on the, on the world stage? Oh, Jay, that's a really tough question. And the, the first thing to understand is that our, our countries have radically different conceptions of what human rights are. And if you go back to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which both China and the U.S. signed, both parties can find items therein that they support that the other nation doesn't support. So both sides have textual evidence to back them up. Let's talk about, I'm going to answer your question in two ways, though, Jay. I want to talk first about what a, a typical U.S. response to China's human rights record is. And then I'm gonna flip that over and talk about what a Chinese response to US record is. So for the typical American response, let's bring up another map. And if you look at this map, it portrays the different provinces and regions of China. From the American perspective, what China has done to Tibet since 1951 is a gross human rights violation. Millions of citizens put in prison, millions of citizens murdered. That's happening now in Xinjiang too, right? Where the Uyghurs are being uh, over 2 million of them now put in prison without due trial, without due process. Uh, people are calling this cultural genocide. If you look on the map, okay, the, the blue region next to Tibet and Xinjiang is what's called Qinghai. Historically, the Qinghai province was in fact a part of Tibet. If you look at maps prior to World War II, that was Tibet. So looking at this map shows you that from the American perspective, roughly the entire Western third of China is a zone of colonial occupation where we witness every day gross human rights violations. And so clearly from the US perspective, this is just a catastrophe. But now flip it over, Jay. And I can tell you that, you know, I go to China every year and I have lots of friends in China. And when, when we sit down to dinner, they look at me and they go, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry for you Americans living in that culture with 15% unemployment, living in that culture that tolerates hundreds of thousands of homeless people roaming your streets, living in a culture where one out of every five children suffers from food insecurity. From the Chinese perspective, American culture is literally a machine of cruelty. We don't really care about people's physical well-being. You can have free speech, but eh, if you're homeless, you know, bummer for you. So what happens is the Americans, you know, we privilege our liberty and the Chinese privilege physical security. So we have a real clash on what values matter regarding human rights. And we see this now most clearly in Hong Kong. What the Chinese Communist Party has done to Hong Kong, from my perspective, is a, is a huge political crime. They've taken what was, in my opinion, the greatest city on the planet. They've destroyed the free press. They're crushing the market. Just this week, they arrested the founders of the Tiananmen Memory Museum, and they dismantled it physically yesterday. So this is a, you know, a war against memory, a war against critical thinking, a war against free speech. Now, from the Chinese perspective, the opium wars started from Hong Kong when the Japanese invaded. During World War II, they came through Hong Kong. When the Cold War was in full swing, the CIA's largest base in Asia was in Hong Kong. So from the Chinese perspective, Hong Kong has always been the soft underbelly of the empire and therefore must be clamped down. So again, we just have these radically different visions of what matters. Now, to go to your real question, Jay, what do we do? 
we are not going to change the Communist Party's policy in Xinjiang, and we are not going to change what they're doing to Hong Kong. But we can begin a mature and sophisticated dialogue, explain our position to them, listen to their position to us, and begin to try to build bridges of cooperation, which again, as I said before, I think could be around climate change, around the drug trade, around piracy in Southeast Asia. I think those are three easy win-win scenarios. Let's start with those and build from there. You know, Stephen, with you know, what's going on in Hong Kong, really travesty in all directions. Um, and of course, it's intended, at least in part, for effect. It's intended to intimidate the people inside of China, not to do the same kind of protest. And certainly, it's intended to intimidate the people in Taiwan. Uh, you know, uh, Hong Kong could happen in Taiwan. Um, and it, it strikes me that this is you know, so obvious uh, that the people in those places, that is uh, in Hong Kong, in, in, in mainland China and in Taiwan, um, they don't take a good message from this. It, it doesn't take rocket science uh, to make them understand that this is not good policy. And, and the question is whether that's sustainable. Are they losing popularity control because of these draconian steps they've been taking? Uh, I think the answer, Jay, is to say, A, they are losing popularity and support, both obviously in Hong Kong and with Taiwan. And, and Chow Ning can talk about this too. I mean, she knows more about the Taiwan situation, but clearly, you know, Tsai Ing-wen was not doing well in the polls in Taiwan. And then the Communist Party rolls into Hong Kong and crushes free speech in Hong Kong. And she defends the protesters and suddenly, boom, President Tsai Ing-wen is a hero, right? So the Taiwanese have taken the message that we can't trust China. What they call one country, two systems is now clearly shown to be a lie. So A, what the party has done in Hong Kong has a terrible political decision for short term. But B, you got to think long term. Take Hong Kong. What we're seeing from Hong Kong is a flight of capital. We're seeing a brain drain. We're seeing all the professors who can leave are leaving. <laughs> all the journalists who can leave are leaving. I mean, the, the city is literally turning over overnight. And from our perspective, that's a catastrophe. The Communist Party will simply enable new Chinese party members to move into those roles. And 20 years from now, it'll be a fully Chinese city. So they're going to take a, a hit now on their soft power so that they can get a long-term geostrategic win. And that's the difference between the United States and China. They're playing a long game. Yeah. Chao Ning, uh, your name has been invoked in, in connection with the comments on Taiwan in this, in this conversation. What are your thoughts? So I, I have families in Hong Kong. I visited Hong Kong in 2017. Uh, the last time I was in Hong Kong, I enjoyed good food, you know, friendship, ding sum, all those good memories. I didn't know that could be my last time visiting Hong Kong, really, 2017. It was just four years ago, and it feels like a different world right now. I have so many you know, scholar friends in Hong Kong, working very good, prestigious universities. Uh, they are looking for jobs every, and, and somewhere else. Uh, they cannot wait to leave. And in the classroom, they are going through self-censorship. Uh, because it's it's just so unclear to them what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Where where is that red line? You know, they they really try to be they try to sanitize their own message. They try to be very very careful and very safe with that critical perspective. Um, it, it's just so so sad to see. But I think we as Taiwanese we 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 took a hard lesson from. Uh, what happened in Hong Kong. And that just make us even more determined to safeguard what we have. Uh, and I, I really think uh, it, it, Taiwan, Taiwan matters. Taiwan matters a lot. Taiwan matters a lot for uh, many different reasons. You know, a lot of people would think about Taiwan matters just because of the strategic position. And I think a lot of people think about, you know, the parallel between Taiwan and Hawaii. You know, Hawaii provides a strategic location to control the Pacific Ocean. Taiwan is also like, you know, one of the critical links in the so-called first island chain that includes Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia. Uh, just months ago, in a joint statement issued by Japanese Prime Minister Suga 
and President Biden, they both mentioned that stabilizing the situation surrounding China is important for the stability of the international community. So I think Taiwan matters because of that strategic position. But China, Taiwan is also a free and robust economy, Jay. I mean, last year, the whole world struggled with the pandemic. However, Taiwan reported a positive 3.11 GDP growth, which ranked first in Asian Pacific region. And I don't know if you guys ever heard about the company, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, which is basically the world's third largest semiconductor company alone accounts for more than 50% of global chip making market. And in the shortage of, you know, global shortage of chips, I think Taiwan would matter too. Uh, and the last thing why Taiwan matters is that Taiwan is a firm believer of human rights. Taiwan is the very first country to legalize same-sex marriage uh, in Asia in 2019. And recently we saw the establishment of the Transitional Justice Committee in Taiwan, which Stephen and I visited uh, two years ago. And the mission of this committee really is to do a deep self-reflection of our authoritarian past so the society can progress to true democracy. So I think all of these reasons uh, explain why Taiwan matters. And I'm very happy, I'm sorry this is a long answer to your question, but if I can just say one more thing, I'm very happy to see, uh, you know, here in the US, we started to see this positive sentiment toward Taiwan. So if I can just pull out that survey done by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. In this survey, you can see that the public sentiment, the positive sentiment to Taiwan reached its highest point since 1971. Uh, 78, I'm sorry. Meaning that here in the U US, most Americans see Taiwan as an ally and somehow China as a, as a rival. And this public sentiment would shape US policy toward Taiwan because if we can move to the next slide, you will see that almost 70% of Americans they support Taiwan, they see Taiwan to some extent as an independent entity, independent country. They support the idea of the inclusion of Taiwan in international organizations, UN, WHO. But I'm most surprised to the answer uh, to the last question. The answer to the last question is that 52% of Americans favor using US troops to defend Taiwan if China were to invade the island. I know Stephen wrote an article about, no, China is not going to invade Taiwan, but it is also very comforting to see some numbers here that almost half of the American society support the idea uh, to, to, to defend Taiwan should anything bad happen. Um, so yeah, Taiwan matters uh, and we support Hong Kong and we want the support from the international community as well. Thank you, Chowning. Actually, your comments are very touching. Uh, let's go to Stephen here. <clears throat> okay, uh, all in all, you know, when you consider all the things you've been talking about, Professor Hartnett, um, China's diplomacy seems kind of confused. On the one hand, you have Belt and Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, the, the rhetoric about shared destinies and harmonious relationships. On the other hand, you have debt traps, you have wolf warrior diplomats stoking conflict globally. So which message is more accurate regarding China's ambitions, its true policy, um, its, true, its true aspirations? And what do these confusions tell us about China's leadership? Where is China heading? Uh, the Washington Post uh, article about the internal conflict, um, you know, really suggests that we have an, a cultural revolution. What's the connection um, between Xi's leadership internally, um, trying to get people, I guess, to be more patriotic, and externally? It all seems like there's too many things going on. Uh, how could this change? How attached is it to Xi? How powerful is he now? And um, what did he have for breakfast? 
Yeah, you are the, the master of asking complicated questions, brother. There's about 12 questions in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick and choose some of them to answer. But first, let me just say that, uh, let me flip your question on its head and share with you that from the Chinese perspective, the people with the confused foreign policy are America. And it really goes to the heart of what happens to foreign policy under democracies. Think about the rotation from George Bush to President Barack Obama to the insanity of Donald Trump and now to Joe Biden. And from the Chinese perspective, they look at us and they're like, that's no way to run international foreign policy, to change your mind every four years. That's just crazy. So if we're going to talk about a confused foreign policy, you know, America has one too. We'd not admit that up front. Now, to go directly to your question, though, Jay, China's foreign policy is confused because China, like America, is a country that is undergoing a profound legitimacy crisis in the political class. I'll tell you a, a story. I was last time I was in China, 2019, I visited with a day. I spent a day with the International Department of the Communist Party. These are basically young kids, blue jeans, T-shirts. They've all been educated in the West. They're heavily wired. They're cosmopolitan. They're all drinking lattes. And what they want is international peace. Using our American vocabulary, we'd say that they're, they're hipsters. They're liberal hipsters. Uh, I left that meeting, got on a bus, picked up a copy of the Global Times, and the Global Times was, was just screaming about why we needed to invade Taiwan. <laughs> and they had quotations from PLA generals, you know, plotting out the invasion. And I share those stories just to say that China is fractured politically, just like America. You've got your liberals and your conservatives. You've got internationalists and isolationists. Xi Jinping looks to be the paramount leader in Stalinistic style, but he is not. He is threatened in all directions by rival factions. So China's foreign policy is so confused because China's confused. What we as Americans need to do, therefore, is to form alliances with the liberal factions, those who support free speech, those who believe in international law, those who will acknowledge the free and independent status of Taiwan. And what that means is we need to be building more international conferences, more cultural exchanges, more student and faculty exchanges. Uh, we need ping pong diplomacy times 10 to increase contact between our cultures. Chowning talked about how there's no free press in China, so they don't really get an honest portrayal of who we are and what we believe in. And that's where we as activists and scholars and leaders need to build those bridges of collaboration. So China's confused, but so are we. So, you know, we need to build and fix democracy at home. We need to form alliances with the liberals there, and we need to shore up our alliances in the Indo-Pacific. If we can do those three things, I think we're all gonna be happy. In my visit to Shanghai in um, 2003 or so, uh, my, my friends there pointed out that there were, there were satellite dishes on every other apartment. And the satellite right. dishes were able to get signal from outside of China. Is that still the case? How important a factor is that, that they're able to get internet signal from outside? I'll tell you a funny story, Jay. So, you know, the party has outlawed VPN, right? Virtual private networks, which is what all the hipsters used to get on the internet. And Chowning, again, was talking before about how the internet is so clamped down in China. But it's a dirty little secret in China that anybody who wants to can get a VPN and access anything they want. I was talking to a very high ranking party member and I asked her, what's up with the VPNs? And she said, look, you've got to understand that we trust the middle class. We know we can't do international business without the internet. We can't be a sophisticated society without the internet. So, so anybody who wants to can get a VPN, that's fine. What we don't want is the peasants getting online. She said very clearly, all the revolutions in China have started in the countryside with the peasantry. That's who we're afraid of. So it's a little dirty secret that, you know, we think there's no free internet in China, but everybody's got VPNs, including all the party members. So they're all reading the New York Times every day. They're reading the Washington Post every day. So it's really important for us to keep pushing our values and to be true to our values, knowing that they will make it into China via those VPNs. Uh, Chowning, do you have anything to add on that? You're a communications person. I'm sure you studied this uh, in, in your career. 
Yeah, I, I, I do agree with Stephen. I'm sure there are, you know, various voices uh, inside China, uh, fractions, uh, different views. Um, and, and I think that's why uh, we, we say this earlier. A lot of times they're, the messages that they produce seems to uh, aim for international audience, but it is also for their domestic audience, right? It is part of their ruling. It is a way for them to, to, to boost nationalism, to boost the sense of uh, uh, patriotism, the, the pride, the national pride. And uh, I've been like studying the strategic messaging uh, produced by, by China for a while. Uh, to my surprise, I really, really see this evolution and transformation from, you know, maybe in 2008 when we uh, saw, you know, Beijing Olympics, the, the narrative of the China story is more about the culture, the the history historical glory, uh, the, 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 the harmony of the people as a society. It's, it's really very focused on, on the culture and how, you know, oh, if you still remember the slogan of Beijing Olympics, one world, one dream, right? So it's, 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 it's a time that, you know, the soft power strategies used by China is very much about the cultural attractiveness and that China has uh, finally made it and they are ready to be part of the international society and they are ready to play by international rules. One world, one dream. Uh, but recently, especially last year during the pandemic, we started to see the stories uh, focus less on the culture, but more on the political leadership and the political system in China. So they uh, spend a lot of time talking about their pandemic governance, the efficiency of such governance, which is even better than what the US is doing, like this a society is so divided, people refuse to get vaccination, right? So, so they, they really use that as an opportunity to praise the Chinese political system and its uh, leadership. They also use vaccine as a form of diplomacy. So China really made a show for vaccine delivery to Hungary, Serbia, Turkey, uh, to demonstrate its international leadership. So if we pay close attention to all this like diplomatic messaging, the soft power strategy used by, by China to tell its story, you really see that how it evolved from this culture focused message to now it is more about governance. It's now more about uh, political system. It's, it's basically uh, uh, about the Chinese political leadership. Uh, I think this says a lot of about China being very confident right now. Uh, also, uh, I think the phenomenon of wolf warriors that you mentioned earlier and Stephen mentioned more earlier, we are going to see that more and more often in the future. Uh, diplomatic wolf warriors, vernacular wolf warriors, but they are going to use media and social media as a format to push that idea that Chinese model of ruling might be the best, even better than democracy. Well, these initiatives, can they walk and chew gum at the same time? I mean, before it was uh, public diplomacy strategies um, <clears throat> and it was addressed at least the time of the Olympics to cultural heritage, as you said. Um, <clears throat> and now it's it's changed, okay? In the model, and now it's addressing uh, models of governance, uh, pandemic management, uh, showing that China you know, has its act together in, in management. Um, but the question is, um, is this a transition? Is it a replacement of messaging? Is it an addition to older messaging? Are the older messages still built in or, or do we just drop the old one and go to the new one? How does that work with 1.4 billion people? I mean, I would like to hear from Stephen too, but for me, I really see this as a, as a transformation, you know? focusing on culture, focusing on this cultural appealingness. Uh, this is very much Joseph Nye's idea of soft power, right? You, you, you want to, you know, appeal to, to, to your uh, outside audience. You want to have them do whatever you want, not through co 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 forces or uh, sanction, but through cultural appealingness. 
And that's that's why like earlier stories so much about cultural heritage, the historical glory, uh, something that we all share in humanity. But recently it's more about governance. And we know that Chinese governance is quite different from the Western model of governance. So that when they are so uh, heavily pushing this Chinese model of ruling, uh, inevitably we will see the tension between two different kinds of ideology, democracy and autocracy. So for me, this is more like a transformation. And that really says a lot about China's confidence and how it is will uh, it is ready to claim its superiority in the global stage. But I would like to hear from Stephen too, like how do you see this? Do you see this as a complementary strategy or a replacement? Yeah, I, and this is this is the one place where I think Chowning and I have a very different response, which is Chowning sees the turn to Stalinism as a sign of confidence. And I see the turn to Stalinism as a sign of just like knee shaking terror on their part. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I've been writing about the Xinjiang region and studying what the party says about Xinjiang. And one of the great lines from one of the foreign ministers was to say, we will not let Xinjiang become China's Syria. That says a lot to us, right? That, that the Communist Party is hunkered down in Beijing and they're looking at the Middle East, they're looking at India, they're looking at America and Latin America. And what they see everywhere they look is utter chaos. They see narco lords running Latin America. They see COVID ravaging America. They see India, the second largest democracy in the world with virtually no functioning government that you can speak of. And from the party's perspective, it's just chaos. And what they have always feared is the chaos migrating into China through Hong Kong, through Xinjiang, through Tibet. And so I see the turn to Stalinism as this, just this sign of terror that they don't want the chaos inside China. And that's why they won't give the peasants the internet, right? Because they just don't trust their own people enough to let them have the truth. So, so this, is the, this is the only thing I think Xiaoning and I disagree on. She sees it as a sign of strength. I see it as a sign of terror. But we agree that their response to the terror is to clamp down and try to avoid chaos. What they don't seem to understand is that Stalinism never works. It didn't work in Russia and it can't work in China. So it's, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more they clamp down, the more they're gonna hurt their soft power. The more they clamp down, the less international prestige they're going to have. So the more they go down Xi Jinping's road, the less effective they're gonna be in the long term. That's the tragedy of where China is right now is that they're, they're doing things that won't help them in the long run. Uh, <clears throat> Ning, I have a, a sense that you might want to respond to Stephen on this. No, I, I would like to believe Stephen, really. I would like to believe <laughs> that uh, what he's saying is true. Uh, I, I, I don't think I disagree with him, uh, but you know, I'm from Taiwan and we really, really live um, in the shadow and the fear uh, of, of China's threat for many, many years. And this kind of threat can come in different forms. Sometimes it's economic uh, sanction. Sometimes it's just you know cultural assimilation. And sometimes it can be military forces. Uh, we live under such threat. So sometimes it's really hard for us to just say, you know, this is just insecurity talking. It feels so real. It feels so real that we cannot just you know reduce this as us uh, insecurity. So by all means, I really do want to believe Stephen. I really do. I really do. Uh, but I, I, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think she means it. I think she means it. No, I think Chowning might be right, though, too. And I, I, I do just want to say, for those of you who haven't seen the news, just this week, the Communist Party went into Hong Kong and they arrested the founders and leaders of the Tiananmen Square Massacre Museum and then they physically dismantled it. And I've worked with those people. They are my friends. They are my colleagues. And so while I'm saying they're scared, Channing's right, they're also arresting our friends. And so yeah. it's just terrifying moment. Well, taking all of that together, everything we've talked about uh, and building in that, you know, um, there's nothing so constant as change. You know, when we, uh, the think tech talks to a lot of scientists and we ask scientists to make prognostications and they always say, that's not in my wheelhouse. Um, science does not call for prognostications, but social science does. Uh, 
Okay, and so I want to ask you perhaps the most unfair question of all. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen in relationship between China and the United States, between China and the world? How are these two powers going to evolve together in terms of credibility, in terms of influence, in terms of um, affluence? Um, where are we going here? Let's, let's thank you first, Stephen. Well, you know, Che, you're asking a question that can't be answered, of course. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I like to think that international relations is the practice of what is possible, not what should be, right? That's fantasy land. International relations are what is possible. I think that the Biden administration needs to focus on what's possible. And that means rebuilding alliances with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines. We need to reestablish democracy as a credible form of governance that is marketable internationally. We can control that. We can't control what the Communist Party does. So we need to get our own house in order. And, and I agree with Chen Ning that a big part of getting our house in order is to fully and clearly and explicitly back and support Taiwan from the threats that are coming out of China right now. So I don't know what China is going to do, but I just wish that the Biden administration would focus on enhancing democracy and building alliances. Chen Ning, what do you think? I mean, we are all following the news. President Biden and President Xi had another phone conversation just yesterday, right? Uh, during that conversation, they talk about collaborations. They, they all express their willingness to collaborate. But I think the truth is that we are going to see intensified competition between these two superpowers for the years to come. Uh, yes, I think they might be able to collaborate on issues. Uh, Stephen just mentioned climate change to be one. But I also think very likely uh, someone would uh, weaponize uh, issues of human rights, issues of climate change to get what they want from the bargaining, from the negotiation. Uh, my sense is that this competition between US and China is going to continue for many, many years to come. So the conversation that we are having here today is actually very valuable. It's valuable. It's to bring uh, like-minded people to, to pay attention to issues between US and China and hopefully come up with some um, a strategic solution interpretation. Um, so we all are better prepared for what is coming. Yeah, it's kind of a moving target. I hate to use the word target. Yeah. Um, Stephen, can we take another look at your book? Uh, I wonder if the staff can show Stephen's book. And, and you are prognosticating in your book um, about the future. So where can I get that book? Uh, available on Amazon or best bookstores in your neighborhood, Jay. And where else can I read up on this? And this is really cutting edge discussion. So where else would you suggest I go? What websites, what sources? Uh, that's a great question, Jay. And you know, I begin every day by reading the New York Times and the Washington Post. From there, I go to SUP China, S-U-P, SUP China, as in what's up, China? Fantastic clearinghouse for news about China. Then I go to China File, which is a great website. Uh, the BBC and The Guardian from London have done great coverage. And a, a, a site that a lot of liberals don't know about, but they should know about, is Radio Free Asia, RFA.org. So we have no shortage of great coverage on these issues, Jay. The news is out there. You just got to go find it. Chow Ning, uh, how about you? What do you look at, either in English or in Mandarin? Well, or I'll Cantonese, for that matter. <laughs> I would, I would agree with Stephen. He mentioned some really outstanding sources. Uh, for me, because I speak both languages, so I also read a lot of newspapers from Taiwan. Uh, that becomes a, a good way to see things from a different perspective. Um, I, I Recently, I see a lot of you know foreign reporters, correspondents, they uh, leave China, come to Taiwan, and that really create a great opportunity for uh, you know, the story of Taiwan being told in a different way, not as a, you know, add on to the China story, but a story with its own weight and its own subjectivity. So I've been following those news coverage, and I think that really adds another perspective into our understanding of U.S.-China relations. Okay, let's take a, mem a moment on questions here. Uh, we have a question. We have, we have uh, questions that came in on the Q&A and on the chat. First question, for Hong Kong, 
is there a realistic path forward in the next decade? And I keep thinking 2047, but in the next decade uh, for them to regain their primary autonomy, uh, that is uh, self-governance as in the past and independence from China, or will conditions only further continue to deteriorate and ultimately become more similar to, uh, I don't know, this is a fair comparison, uh, more similar to an Israel-Palestine-Gaza strip arrangement with periodic military incursions and tighter entry-exit controls being enforced. What do you think, Stephen? Uh, Hong Kong is done. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but Hong Kong is done. Look at what's happened in Tibet, right? I mean, you, you, I was in Tibet uh, just a couple of years ago visiting Lhasa. You know, there's Mercedes Benz dealers on the corner next to monasteries. Um, you know, they're showing Chinese TV. They're, they're not teaching the Tibetan language in the schools. I mean, Tibet, Tibetan culture is just being erased. That's what's going to happen in Hong Kong. That's what's now happening in Xinjiang. So I hate to say it, but uh, no, Hong Kong is done. The Hong Kong we know is it's over. Why? Well, hate- Please. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say I would uh, I hate to say this, uh, but I would uh, agree with Stephen on this. I, I think uh, there is very little can be done uh, to reverse the situation in Hong Kong. Um, but I also think this is a time that international support is particularly important. We should keep talking about Hong Kong. We should keep talking about situations in Hong Kong um, as a way to demonstrate solidarity and as a way to, to offer our support. So it's not going to, uh, the end game is not going to come that fast. Okay, here's one more question. Uh, with the official crackdown on VPNs by the Cyberspace Administration of China since mid 2017. Uh, how has uh, how easy is it for the average uh, uh, Chinese citizen to get past the Great Firewall of China? Yeah, that's a great question, and there's been a lot of literature on that. And people are referring to this now as the cat and mouse game. Uh, and the way I like to play the cat and mouse game. Last time I was in China, summer of 2019, before COVID is I went to China with five different VPNs on my laptop. And each day I would rotate which one I would use. If you use the same VPN two days in a row, it gets flagged. So you got to rotate your VPNs. But if you do that, uh, it works. And that's what the hipsters in China all do. They've got laptops loaded up with multiple VPNs and they, and they rotate their usage so they can't get busted. Uh, busted, what does busted mean? What kind of penalties are involved if they find out you're doing that? Uh, funny story there, Jay. I, 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 last time I was in China, uh, my wife and I went out to dinner. And my wife, before dinner, was doing some work on her laptop on her hotel room. So we went out to dinner with some friends and we came home and we came home and her laptop was gone out of a, out of a hotel room. We were like, hmm, that's interesting because there's not really any crime in China. So we went down to the front desk and we're like, oh, yes, we were cleaning up your laptop for you. <laughs> and they had erased all the VPNs off my wife's <laughs> laptop. So sometimes they'll respond technologically. Sometimes they'll send someone to your room and take your computer. And if you, you know, other worse things can happen as well. So, you know, I want to be, I want to step back here because I'm laughing about something that's not very serious. I mean, it's a cat and mouse game, but if you lose the game, you're going to go to prison. So it's, it's really very dangerous. So I, I don't want your listeners to think I'm making light of just how dangerous it is to live in a Stalinist society that does not believe in free information. So you can get VPNs, you can use VPNs, but the party's gonna crack down. So it's this, you're constantly playing cat and mouse, trying to get away with something that you know is illegal. Okay, with the, uh, another question, uh, you wanna add anything to that, Chani? Okay, would the Belt and Road Initiative have any weight in how the relationship China, uh, the relationship between China and the U.S. Uh, would develop in the next few years, um, does it? Will it? How would that happen? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Chaining, you or me? Even you. <laughs> now, here's the thing about the Belt and Road Initiative: is that the Belt and Road Initiative is not, in fact, an economic Marshall Plan for the world. That's what the party wants you to think, but that's just their messaging. It's not a Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was meant to help rebuild Europe so the democracies could thrive. The Belt and Road is is China rolling into underdeveloped countries and building railways with their own labor. 
building ports with their own labor, using technology imported from China. So they're not actually helping these countries develop indigenous technologies or indigenous infrastructure. So what the Chinese are going to learn as they try to do this in Southeast Asia and Africa is the same lesson the British and the Russians and the Americans learn, which is that economic colonialism only makes enemies. Thank you. Well, we got one more. I think this is the last one. I think this is, uh, this is yours, Chani. Um, this is what about the role of education? What about getting Chinese students to the US and for that matter, U.S. students to China, just as just as what happened, you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, it seems to have, um, you know, declined. How do we continue this two way flow um, that seems to be stuck now? Wouldn't that be helpful for, for relations between the two countries? Well, before we can end this pandemic, I think there will be no flow of international students whatsoever because international traveling is so difficult right now. So I think this pandemic is a very, very urgent issue that we all have to focus on. Uh, but this, you know, intensifying competition between the U.S. and China is going to affect uh, the enrollment of international students in both countries for, for sure. I am here in Michigan uh, at Oakland University. Our neighboring university, Michigan State University, used to have about, I don't know, 7,000 Chinese students per year. Uh, recently, they lost so many Chinese students that it create an enrollment issue for them. And that is because the visa issue, uh, also the, the, you know, the political rhetoric involved in all this like school applications and the distrust between the US and China and also the fear, you know, also the fear. Uh, um, Chinese students are reading news. They understand there is this rise of anti-Asian American movement here in the US. They understand that, you know, China is now the new target. They've been demonized. Um, so I think they also have this fear um, so I, I do think universities, higher educations, we should be, uh, we should do a better job. We should be more responsible to prepare them. Uh, other than recruit them, we should also prepare them uh, in terms of what they are going to face in this country. Uh, we need to really facilitate this process so that it will be as smooth as possible because at the end of the day, we, we need this intercultural uh, exchange and students, international students, really is the best way to increase that international dialogue. We, we really cannot stop talking to each other. And this is something that I strongly agree with Stephen and international students play a key role in this conversation. Stephen? Yeah, I mean, Chao Ning is exactly right. International students aren't coming to America anymore because of COVID. The other big issue, though, you know, so at, I'm at the University of Colorado, Denver, where we run a program called the International College Beijing. We have hundreds of Chinese students come to America. We send our kids to Beijing. It's, a, it's just a beautiful program. It's an example of what's possible when countries act like grownups. And last time I was in Beijing, I was meeting a bunch of parents of potential students, and a mother pulled me aside and said, is my daughter going to get shot? <laughs> And it's not a crazy question. It really oh, isn't, right? Oh. They look, again, this goes back to what we said before, Jay. The, the Chinese parents who you know, want to send their 18-year-old kid to America, they look at America and what do they see? They see homelessness, they see gun violence, they see pornography and drug use and online gambling. And they're like, why would we send our kid to that? So America cannot be a beacon of hope for the world if it's total chaos on the streets. So we have to clean house at home. In another trip I took to China early in the 2000s, I met a woman lawyer there uh, in Shanghai. And she had a law degree from you know, Chinese schools. But as is often the case, she, she was uh, bound uh, on a career course to take an LLM in the United States. So she took an LLM in the year 2001. Um, and on September 10th, uh, she arrived in Manhattan. And NYU was the school. Uh, the NYU Law School, my alma mater, uh, and they gave her a, uh, a, a dormitory room right, right across from Twin Towers. So in the morning, her first morning in the United States, on September 11th, I think it's appropriate we discuss this now, given the 
you know, 20th anniversary. Um, she set out to find NYU. She did not speak a lot of English and to start her program there. And she didn't get a block away from her dormitory when, you know, the first plane hit the first tower. And, um, and of course, it was chaos on the street and people running and there was, you know, all this debris all over and smoke and dust and fumes. And she was really lost. You can imagine. She had first trip, you know, you can imagine. Out of the crowd, after she was wandering, trying to get uptown, after the crowd thinned out and she's walking up toward NYU or where she thought it would be, a man came out of the crowd and he said, are you Audrey Lee? And he was an NYU alumnus. And he was detailed to find her in the madness of lower Manhattan that day. And he did find her. And he took her home. When I talked to her about this story, she said, <laughs> she will always remember. I, I would always remember too. And she will always love America. Now that's soft power. <laughs> so uh, we promised you an opportunity for a takeaway. Uh, let's, let's start with you, Chowning. Can you give us your takeaway, what you want us to remember about this discussion? Uh, I just, again, want to appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think this competition between US and China is only going to intensify in the coming years. Uh, so I think we all have to prepare ourselves. And as you know, like someone like myself from Taiwan, and I'm sure other countries across the world caught between these two superpowers, we need to have more dialogue. We need to have more conversations. And maybe we can come up with some strategic alliances in one way or another so that we can together, you know, self through this coming upcoming storm safe and sound. So eventually I think the competition will continue and the conversation needs to continue as well. Steven? Jay, before I give you my takeaways, I just wanted to say thank you to you and Carol Mon Lee from Think Tank Hawaii for being great hosts. And I wanna thank Shirley Daniel at the Pacific Asia Management Institute for being terrific hosts and the University of Hawaii Center for Chinese Studies, especially the Chung family for its generosity. Uh, and I just want to say, Tianeng, it's always an honor to get to work with you. I think you're such a terrific international ambassador. So it's really just been fun and an honor to get to, to, to hang out with you all today. In terms of my takeaways, Jay, uh, I'll tell you this. I've gone to China every summer for the last 15 years. And every time I talk to people on the street in China, they love America. They ask about our music. They want to know who's winning the basketball games. They want to know how the Mets are doing. We have soft power in America. Everybody digs American music. We need to capitalize on democracy. We need to be true to our values. And we need to help those in China who share those values. So we need to do a lot less beating China and telling it what it's doing wrong. And we need to fix democracy at home. That's my takeaway message. Well, there are other other chat uh, points that I would like to read to you because it's their it's their takeaway. It's the takeaway of the attendees who have watched uh, your discussion. I think you'll appreciate hearing them. <clears throat> Here they are. What a great panel! This is an awesome topic. Salute to Stephen, a research scholar on China and global issues. Ah. Thank you, Stephen, for your comments about bridges of collaboration, ping pong diplomacy, X10, and other insights shared today. Uh, thank you, Chao Ning, for presenting the view uh, that is very much aligned with my colleagues in Taiwan who have expressed this view to me as well. Um, and let's see, there's others too. Nice discussion, lots of insights. Um, thanks, Jay, for the amazing story about 9-11 <laughs> and the student at NYU. Um, let's see. Great job, Shirley, and all who were involved in presenting this uh, this program. Jay and Shirley, thank you for bringing this terrific program to Scheidler. My last trip was also 2019 August to both the PRC and Hong Kong, and their observation, the observations of panelists are so right on. I believe that U.S. soft power will win out uh, in the very long run. Thank you to both panelists for confirming much of what I believe. Cheers, everyone. Hope to meet them someday. 
And the last one, thank you all. Very informative and appreciate your collective knowledge and willingness to share. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, you guys. What a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you to Shirley Daniel, of course, for putting this important program together. Uh, thank you uh, to the uh, Paul Chung uh, Trust for funding it. Thank you to our attendees and viewers uh, and Mrs. Chung, who makes it all possible. Aloha to you all. Stay safe uh, in your home, your office, and geopolitically stay safe. Xie uh, Xie and Sai Jin, I hope it's still okay to say that. Thank you very much, everyone.